Uh, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. I'm, my name is Babita. I'm from India and I'm working for in EGA since last two years as a postdoc. And today, um, me, me and my colleagues, Aina and Martha, are going to give you a bit of flavor for new development in, uh, in EGA. What are the new features? Um, let me start by talking a bit of, about EGA. So EGA is the European Genomics Ar Archive. It functions as the permanent, uh, uh, sick, um, permanent and secure archiving of the genomics personally identifiable data set. Uh, the sensitive data set. It has been. It has its own uh, data access committee for for accessing those data set. It has. It is providing, uh, and not only it is providing as a storage. It also is providing those data set uh, in a controlled manner for to be shared for research purposes. It is based uh, at two places, or the service has been shared by two places. One at EBI in the UK, and uh, another at Barcelona in Spain. And uh, we, I mean, you will see a bit more, you will hear a bit more about how it functions from Aina and Martha later on. Uh, we have, uh, since it has started, we see a growth uh, in, in, the, in the archival, the data that we are receiving since last past uh, September 2020, we had around 12 petabytes of data uh, in, in our archive and then the, around 3 million files. Uh, likewise, this data is being accessed for, for further uh, data upcycling, we call, uh, to, for further uh, usage. And uh, there's, there's the requesters the, for, for this data has been uh, growing. Uh, you can see on your, on your right uh, most, of the, where, where most of the requests we receive. So for example, United States and United Kingdom being one of the major requesters. But today I will, I'm here to talk more about the imminent challenges that this kind of data resource, uh, resources, especially the genomics data resources face. Uh, this is one, one study published by Ivan Bernie in 2017, which said that uh, in the year 2012, for example, we, we saw genomics data set, you know, sequencing data set coming from mainly from research laboratories. So the healthcare, uh, the hospitals and clinicians were not involved. In 2017, we see it's growing around 20%. However, now more and more uh, healthcare systems are getting involved with the uh, with genomic data set for the diagnostics and, you know, prognostics purposes. And, and these data is being generated, uh, especially the sequencing facilities being so available and, and getting the precise, you know, uh, variants or mutations you want to. So it's, it's, it's now the healthcare system is going to be a biggest contributor for the such data. And of course, this will bring a lot of challenges for, for the archives like ours. Uh, one of the, that example is this project, uh, a European One Million Genomes. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, it was decided or these uh, around 19 countries signed uh, the treaty, European countries signed this treaty of uh, making available around 1 million genomes by the year 2022. And not only that, it went a bit farther there. Now we have beyond 1 million genomes, which is again signed by around 23 countries, uh, European countries to, to not stop this project, uh, you know, uh, by 2022, but keep it in continuation. Uh, it's important because, uh, because uh, we need more, more genomics data set to be precise in our research and in our findings. And not only from European countries, from everywhere in the world, we know that as much representation we can have from different countries, as much is going to be succeed in our precision for what we are, uh, what we are finding. And, and likewise for, you know, for treatments and medications. So it's, it should represent, uh, for example, in case of rare diseases, so it should represent, you know, all, um, everyone, not not the you know ninety five percent of the population or or, or ninety percent of the pop world population. So so yes, so this is what we are preparing for at EGA, and um, just wanted to throw some light from the same paper uh, that what is the what are the challenges. So biggest. And, and to trust me, the storage and distribution is not one of the biggest challenges, uh, even if we say that they are, we are talking about big data set. It's, main, it's, it's about you know, who owns the data, the privacy of the data, the sensitivity of it, how we are going to share it. You know, European countries, they have their, each country can have their own law for, for the secure, uh, secure um, um, storage and distribution. And, 
uh, the GDPR issues are there. How are you going to access that data? Who interoperability, for example, these countries are, you know, they store their data in different languages. How are they, how can we make them find it findable in a central system? Um, well, many other, should that data be, be uh, distributed for, for research or uh, other purpose should, or should it just stay at one place because it could, you know, it's the, it's the sensitive um, EHR, I mean, the, the data, they are EHR data, etc. So how should we, how should we find a way to make them usable, but without jeopardizing anything that relates with privacy and so on and so forth. But so there are many challenges that ETA is involved uh, today. So I'm not going to talk about everything. I'll just talk about the federated EGA, which will be the first issue that you see, the local EGA that we have been working on. But hopefully in the next webinar sometime, we talk about different other um, solutions that we are trying to, to, to develop to tackle these issues. Uh, local EGA basically is that the idea here is that what we are trying to do is to provide you a copy of EGA to 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 put it in in your on your data set on your country for example of France on Italy can have their own version of EGA it doesn't have to rely on uh, on a central model central uh, so it, this is the federated system right so um, however the data should be findable somewhere so central EGA will be here to store information of such data for example if you're looking for certain uh, specific gene uh, mutation data set. It should be that one central place where you can search that data. However, the storage will be done is respective to their own, uh, to the country that is installing the local EGA model. So this is the general idea. Um, and uh, I have a very uh, quick uh, in presentation done uh, by uh, Frederic from, from our uh, development team at EGA for, for to explain a bit back and forth communication that goes with, with this central and local EGA. So, so the central EGA is like for user credentials, that will be the central EGA will check the user credentials. It will, the metadata findable here, you can see how it's finding, searching the metadata. Do you have this data, for example? Yes, okay, you, if you found that data, you go back again, you make the communication to the, to the vault uh, where the encrypted files are stored comes back, okay, yes, this data is there, or you provide the access committee request. And then, you know, it's, this is way, this is how we are dividing the, the ingestion distribution and the findability of the data. So what is, what goes and stays at local and what stays or uh, is accessible at central. Another thing, another good thing that you see here is that, uh, uh, the submission portal, which is going to be uh, described briefly by Aina later, is part of this system as well. So submission has been done now. So you can do the partial submission, for example. You can do step by step. It could take. It's a lengthy process. So there has been. It has been um, uh, made better to to participate in this project. And likewise, what you do with the files. So for example, quality of those files. You have to test it before you're ingesting, something like that. So you, that is where Martha will present later, what is uh, the system that we have prepared for that. Uh, okay, so another thing that this system, the federated system uh, was quickly got adopted. So this is very new uh, uh, in development, this, uh, but this, uh, this federated structure got adopted in this COVID-19 uh, grant recently that, that we are working or participating in, it was called Converge Horizon 2020. Uh, so that this, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges for COVID-19 uh, uh, with COVID-19 was that not, this data not being accessible to study it further for, for for viral genome or for uh, you know, human, uh, you know, genome, human patients that were that were infected with the coronavirus. So to tackle one of these challenges, uh, we uh, this this uh, another work package. You know, when this grant was in preparation, it was added to use such models so that at least the data. Uh, you know, it shouldn't stay within its national border just because we don't know how to, what to do with such uh, data set. So the, to provide that one secure option there. So that, that I think it's a, it was a, a good 
successful for us to be used uh, to to use local EGA such way. And another uh, uh, use case examples are different countries so far that has been implemented. For example, Sweden, Finland, and Norway are have already uh, used this model uh, for and implemented it on their side. And we wonder which will be the next country. Uh, for more information about uh, local EGA, please visit our GitHub page. You will find all of the information here at uh, local EGA. And uh, I will also invite you to see this presentation, uh, well, the, the story, the full story, the full presentation done by Fred in, at this website link. So to get more idea of, of its functioning. With this, I would like to thank you and thanks for attending. Please ask your questions in the chat chat box. And very much thankful for the entire team distributed between you know UK and Spain working very hard with for, for this project. Please contact us, write us at the email shown here. Thank you. And uh, so Martha is, uh, of course, one of our colleagues here. She is involved in several different uh, projects. One of this, what she's going to talk about is the quality control reports to before submitting these files or, or, or as a user, if you want to know a bit more about uh, the, what, the, what are the files that you're going to receive or you're going to download. So, so it's important to, to make them pass through certain quality check so that we um, we get maximum benefit out of the of the data. <laughs> Sorry, Marta, go on, please. <laughs> Thank you, Bobby. Uh, well, yes, um, we are going to to check out a little bit the quality control report that we've developed. And uh, well, just to, to summarize a little bit what Bobby has said, uh, we know that the EGA is a repository of human biomolecular data, and its main mi mission is to facilitate the management and the access for long-term archival of this type of data. So if we take a closer look to the, to the numbers, we can see that the EGA is, is very used and it has almost 3,000 studies, over 6,000 data sets. It has a lot of submitters, over 1,000, and a lot of requesters. So, so, so it is worth the, the effort. <laughs> And, and moving on to the to the files that we are holding in the in the EGA, we see here in this uh, tiny pie chart that most of the part is for sequencing files. And if we zoom a little bit, uh, these sequence uh, these sequencing files are mostly FASTQs, BAM, scrams, and BCFs. And these type of files are the ones that uh, will be very important for the quality control report. But before uh, getting more into it, I want to uh, uh, go with you through a use case that uh, would, ha would have happened uh, some months ago. So let's say that there is a research group that it is interested in a, in a data set and they request it. It takes uh, several weeks until they get access to it. And when they get access to it, they, of course, will perform some quality controls on, on the data. And imagine they get something like this, so a very, very bad report that, of course, won't uh, fulfill their expectations. So at this point, uh, what they would have to do is to search for another data set and, well, start the process all over again. And as as I guess you agree, this is not sustainable at all. And we, realize, we realized this, and then what we decided to do is to find a solution for the users to save them a lot of effort and time. And when they are searching for a data set, provide them with some information uh, prior to the QC that they would have done on, on their own. So they can make a decision to go over this a long process or not. And the first step of, of this idea was to explore what is being done. We, as references, uh, we took Bio, UK Biobank, DBGAP, and Dinomat. And the first two, what uh, they are doing is the phenotype quality control. And this means uh, the detection of non -confidential, confidential data display. Uh, genotype and phenotype inconsistencies, data dictionaries, 
and others, and also Genomat, apart from doing this type of QC, they are doing a file QC. This means that they are uh, showing FRED scores, contamination, coverage, read lens, uh, person map reads, etc. But after going through, through all these repositories, what we find uh, found is that there is no consensus about which aspects should be checked during the quality control for the specific uh, file formats that I introduced to you before. And based on this uh, middle conclusion, we decided to go uh, with our own approach. Of course, based on what the community is general, generally doing. So which tools are the most used and in, in general in, by, by informatic analysis. So specifically, if we uh, want to check out the quality of the FASTQ files, I guess you, you've heard of the FASTQC software, and it is recognized as the gold standard tool by the community. What we will get uh, by using this software is the per-base sequence quality, the per-sequence quality scores, per-base sequence content, well, and, and other parameters that are uh, very useful. And this tool is very convenient because its output is already an HTML report. For the one files, uh, we decided to go with some tools that is also a, a gold standard. And it has a very interesting feature that is the, it generates results plots that are uh, great to get an overall idea of, of the quality of the file. But um, specifically, uh, we get the base coverage distribution, the base quality, the percentage of map reads, uh, the percentage of both of the maids maps and, and well, singletons, duplicates, a lot of stats. And finally, for the BCF files, we are using a combination of, of BCF tools and BCF tools that um, are combined with a custom script that is useful to infer the genome assembly from this file and this will be combined uh, with the declared assembly by the user at the submission moment. And apart from, from the genome assembly, of course, uh, we will get information about the site frequency distribution, uh, the trans, uh, transitions, transversion rates, uh, base changes in the distributions, and many, many other, other parameters. But what do we do with the output of these softwares? We decided to transform in, to transform them into a, a JSON file, which we found that it was super nice because the ultimate goal is to show a, a, a report in HTML form. And for the BAM and BCF files, we don't get this as, as an output. And uh, web applications uh, fetch very easily and very conveniently data from JSONs. So we get uh, what we want to show finally at the EGA website. And summarizing a little bit the pipeline, I said that we start uh, from these types of files. And then what we do is run the commands. So call the software that I, that I show you in the previous slide by using a bash scripts. And in combination with these bash scripts, we have Python scripts that as I said, will get the results information and will create the JSON. And I put here a sneak peek of, of the different scripts that we are using. You can see that here we are calling, for example, some, some tools, BCF tools, and then this is the Python script that will uh, read all the outputs. And this will generate, as I said, the JSON report that looks a little bit like this. And of course, the JSON report is not enough. You can see that there is a lot of numbers and information. And what we want to do is to transform it to an HTML that will look mostly like, like what you have here. On the left, you, you see the FASTQC report that I was mentioning before. And then you have uh, the, the QC report that we share at the EJ website. And if we want to to try how the user, what the user would do to it here, we can see that in a data set page, you browse the files, and by clicking this icon, you get to the reports. And there are two sections, the file information and file data. 
and we see that in the file information we have a uh, general info about the file also its connection its connection to the data sets studies and the DAC that are at the EGA and then in the in the other section we have a lot of plots that we will have here we see them here and if you don't know exactly what the bot is showing you have of course also the the description of each plot and um, I would like to revisit at this point the use case, the horrible use case that I shared with you at the beginning, because now that we have the QC, it would go like this. So we have the research group that is interested in a data set. And beforehand, they check out the quality control. And if it fulfills that expectation, what they will, they will do is to request it, of course. And despite it, taking a lot of weeks uh, for them to get into their hands, the process, all the process will be, will be worth it, of course. But uh, how is the quality uh, control reports connected to the local EGA? Well, I think it is very interesting for every node of, of the local EGA uh, to be able to run this pipeline too. So for convenience, what we did was to create a, a container so every node will have the, the ability to, to run this QC and to generate the ASM reports that will be finally uh, fetched from the EA website and shown to the user. And the user will see something like this. So in a data set page, you are browsing the files. And the new thing is that instead of the usual location, let's say UK, you can see that now there is another node that also is uh, holding this file and has uh, its QC report available. But is this everything that, that we want to have as quality controls? Uh, well, of course, no, we have a lot of future perspectives. And I would say that the first one is to listen to the user suggestions and enrich the, the quality control reports with maybe more file information or, or more plots. Also, we would like to implement these quality control pipelines on other file formats, for example, UWAS. And I don't know if you've heard of the multi-QC uh, software, but it would be very convenient because uh, we would be able to produce a single report from many FASTQ files that are in a data set. So we are also, uh, interested in, in developing this. And finally, uh, we would also like to study the phenotype you see as they do in DBGAP or UK Biobank and uh, see how we can integrate it in our, in our quality control report. And as a, as a new addition, uh, we've been preparing a a web, a web page uh, that will be hosted in the, in the EGA2 that has general information about what I, I've been telling you in this, in this presentation. And we plan to also add a questions and answers um, section that I think uh, will be very useful and that we can start with some, some examples of the questions and answers that we get today on the, on the webinar. And well, that's it. Thank you, everyone. And I hope we can answer some of your questions later. Thank you so much, Marta. Yes, as Marta said, please uh, ask questions or su provide us suggestions to make things better. Somebody already asked uh, in the Q&A that are there more um, at the quality checks uh, in queue for more dif uh, different files like uh, array data, et cetera, or GBAS data. So yes, it is in development and you will soon hear about it. Um, okay, thanks, Marta. So let's move to Aina and uh, a bit of, about submitter portal introduction, the new submitter portal, sorry. Uh, Aina, the floor is yours. Yep, thank you very much, Felita. Well, first of all, welcome everybody and good afternoon. My name is Aina Gene and I work um, in the help desk team at EGCIG. And you could say that I'm a little bit of the submission expert and also I've been playing around with some metadata improvements. So today I will talk 
um, well, walk you through on how to deposit data to the EGA. So when a user wants to deposit data to the EGA, the process can be summarized in five easy steps, being the first one, um, requesting a submission account, then encrypt your data. The third step would be to upload the encrypted data to the submission account that was open on the first step, and followed by register your metadata. And finally, the fifth step would be the permanent archival of data. So now I will walk you through step one to four. For the um, first step, how to open an EJ submission account, it is pretty, pretty much a straightforward. You first request an account by populating the formulary on the left. Then the help desk team will send the documents that should be signed, um, which these documents are the authorized submitter list and the data processing agreement. The first one being used for knowing who is allowed to use this um, data. And the second one, it's in order to be GDPR compliant. Finally, the last step is for the help desk team to actually open the submission account and then provide the user with the credentials and further instructions. Oh, oh, no. So step two and three go closely together. Um, the second step, the encryption of the files um, is done either locally on your computer or a virtual machine, which is using a Java-based application named EJ Cryptor. Here an example with a BAM file that um, after running the EGA cryptor, there are three encrypted files as the output files, which are um, GPG MD5 and GPG MD5. Then the third step here is to upload the encrypted files to the, to the box using either FTP or Aspera Connect. So here is one of the an advance of a new feature that it's in the near future we will be modifying the encryption the encryption step so in the new submitter portal we have implemented a g4g standard which is the crypt for gh which allows genomic data to remain secure throughout their lifetime from initial sequencing to sharing with professionals and following the same example after running the relevant comment the output of the file in this case will be .c4gh. And this step will be done by the EGA on the submission box um, of each user. So the new, the new step would be first to open the submission account, then upload files. And EGA will make sure to encrypt the files for you. So once we have the files ready, the next step is to register and submit the metadata related to these files. So um, for the metadata objects, it can vary from the submission and the data type. But here on the right side, you have an overview of all the EGA metadata objects and how they are linked all together. So to submit this metadata, there are many options. But on this um, presentation, I will, I'll, I will be focusing on the two main options related to the submitter portal being the first one, the submitter portal um, as a user interface, um, which I will be referring mostly, most likely as UI. And the second option is the, it's to submit the data programmatically using the API directly. So in here, we'll see the current UI. So this is how the submitter portal currently looks like where you can register all the metadata objects and the metadata objects are separated in different tabs and going from top to bottom. Um, this is a user-friendly way to register your metadata. However, if you have a large and or complex mission, then the best option is to submit your data programmatically. So for the programmatic submission, um, is done by running some specific commands. In here you have um, just a screenshot of the documentation where you can see some of the commands. And um, with this, you can either 
register, validate, or submit your metadata objects. And these objects, these objects can either be in a JSON or an XML format. In this slide, on the right side, um, there's an example of a data set in a JSON format. So this is how it looks and works currently, but now I will be introducing some of the new features that um, our development team is actually working on. Um, so the first one, which was previously explained, is our aim to ease the submission process by using grip 4 gh which apart from being a great encryption technology, it will save our users an encryption step. Then the second will be an improved data model. So we are currently working on improving the data model on our metadata, so it is richer. Um, in this model, we want to increase the number of mandatory fields, and also we are working on developing um, some disease specific data models. So for example, for cancer or infectious diseases. Also in a similar fashion that it's currently working now, we will divide the objects by data and links. So the data objects will contain the actual information that could be used um, in a future research. And while the link objects will purely contain the, the linking information between metadata objects. Um, another improvement will be the user interface, um, which is currently being developed. Um, so we are developing a completely new user interface, will, interface, which will be more user friendly and more efficient. And one of the main difference from the user experience point of view, it will be the breadcrumb view for the submission step that we can see here on the right side of the slide. Then um, another new feature is the tag creation. It, it will be separated from the submission process. So we are also working on the tag portal and um, where the tags will be created. Then the submitters will be, so the tag portal is on the top right and the so current submitter portal is on the bottom right here on the slide. Um, so the submitters will be able to link a tag from the tag portal to a submission in the submitter portal. And also just so you know the DAC portal um, where all the DACs are registered, um, the DACs will also be able to manage their um, data requests. So the final um, new functionality that we want to add is the split submission. So a split submission is what we refer when different accounts are working on the same submission. So for example, one account can work on the samples while the other account is working on the study and data set part. Then the objects from one submission can be shared to the other one. So as I've been saying, um, all these features are still under development, but let me present to you on the next slide um, an example on how it would like the split submission. So here is here we have the submitter portal and the fact that we want to share um, objects. Then we have a sequence facility that they have their own account with their own set of credentials and they start uh, a new submission. Let's call it submission X. Um, in this submission, they register the metadata that they have, which would be samples and experiments and what we call runs. So for you to know, runs are links between samples and files. Then we have in another submission account, the authorized users for a research group, and they have created submission Y. Um, in this submission, they have registered data set, study, policy, and in order to complete the data, sorry, in order to complete the submission, we um, need the sequencing facility to share their submission X to, to the research group. So they want to grant access to submission Y. So once this is done, the objects in submission X will be available under submission Y. So the submission will be completed without sharing each other credentials. So um, to sum up, um, we are fixing the challenges that we are facing and we are working to improve the um, user interface experience. We're also working 
on making the submission process easier to have um, an improved data model with richer metadata. And we are adding new functionalities such as the split submission. Um, any feedback is welcome, or if you have any suggestion, please don't hesitate to email me in, in, in here in my email. And thank you very much. <laughs>